Okay, so uh, we're coming to the end of our program, and um, I think it's been a wonderful day. I think, I uh, hope everyone uh, is coming away with the impression that I am. There's a lot going on in this sector still. There's a lot of interesting things happening. There's a lot of interesting sort of surprising drivers that are popping up and things are coming from directions that are not entirely anticipated. So I thought we could use a couple minutes here if anyone wants to um, put anything on the floor that hasn't been raised or in a topic that you're, is especially near and dear to you that no one has mentioned yet. Um, and so if you had, you already had the floor, Ned. Um, so we're gonna open the floor to folks who haven't had a chance to speak, who might have something they wanna talk about or ask questions about, so let's do that. Kind of an odd question. I work for, for government, so government is always trying to be efficient, right? <laughs> That's semi-funny. Um, but this is the phosphorus, uh, what phosphorus form, you know, and, and, and the nutrients relate so much to each other. I wonder if there is, is there a nutrient forum or something like that where all these organizations cross-populate or, or not populate them, whatever the word is, where they work together to come up to yeah, that's a they learn from each other? Interesting question. It's a near and dear question to my heart, actually, because before my life in phosphorus sustainability, I worked on a theory called ecological stoichiometry which is all about the relationship among carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and other chemical elements in ecological interactions. So I've, all, I've spent most of my career saying, why are you only talking about nitrogen? That's stupid. There's also phosphorus and carbon. Or people talk about phosphorus only. Say, why are you only talking about phosphorus around nitrogen? So, I, so you're exactly right. And very often in the RCN or in the or in the alliance, we're often at the time saying, this is a nitrogen, this is the same, this, why aren't we talking about nitrogen? It's the same set of of issues. There are differences, of course, right, because the sourcing of nitrogen and phosphorus are coming from diff in different directions, and the fate of nitrogen biogeochemically can differ a lot from phosphorus as well. So there are some pretty distinct differences. There are organizations out there that work on the nitrogen management side of things that we inter interact with, and, and so we're trying to join forces with folks in the nitrogen management side of things. Certainly, IPNI has always been nutrients, right? It's, Right, balanced plant nutrition, so you're right. Um, and as we see in several places here, right, if you manage for N, you overload P. If you manage for P, you overload N, or something like that, right? So you really can't um, pay attention to just one thing at a time. And in the water quality management side, there's a big fight about whether you manage nitrogen removal for water quality or phosphorus removal for water quality, and that's a very bitter battle that's still ongoing on in my field of limnology, actually. So I'm very much in favor of an integrated view of, of nutrients and not being so phosphocentric, but the historical uh, dynamics of this group have come out of that, come out of saying there was something interesting going on in the phosphorus sector that this, the RCN and others have focused around over history. But I think there's lots of discussions underway where this group interacts with other groups working on nitrogen. Anything else someone wants to raise? Over there. Still, um, sorry to talk again, but no, it's I, do, okay. <laughs> I do have a big, uh, sort of big, big question to me and from my perspective, and I'm interested in others, um, whether, whether this is true too for them, is um, when it comes to, I, mean, I deal in the, in the recycled phosphorus loop, you know, biosolids, compost, things like that. But the big players in the house are the fertilizer industries and all that. And I know we have a couple of representatives from that sector, but until they're playing in this wholeheartedly and major participation, right, uh, we're just nibbling in the corners, aren't we, of, of how to manage phosphorus. And, 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 and I say that because our, you know, our pitch is, let's recycle the local phosphorus where it is, the local nutrients where they are. Uh, before we bring, like in, in New England, we, we, we don't need any more mined phosphorus coming into the region. It's causing problems. We'd rather see the local, at least I would rather see the local phosphorus recycled there. Um, so how do we tackle that? 
Well, that's a good question. Maybe we'll hear from some folks from that sector. But it, I'm just reminded when we had a previous event of this kind of, some people were here for that. We had uh, Tony Michaels from Midwestern BioAg was here and he gave a talk to our group like this. And he, he, the thing I remember most from his presentation, he was saying, he, he urged the group to dare to be trivial. <laughs> right, so all these things that are rolling out, right? How do you get them to scale, right? Because the there's so much fertilizer that needs to be produced. There's just a huge demand. And so many of the great things that are, we heard about today are not yet, I'm not meaning any ill intention on anyone, they're not yet trivial, not even trivial yet with respect to the overall demand for fertilizer globally. So we have to figure out a way to get the scale with a lot of these things that are talking about, especially in the manure processing world, which you know, Jerry Bingold's here to talk, you know, is involved in that and others as well. So we have to get those big fluxes up to a, to a state where they might begin to uh, play a role in the overall phosphorus cycle. But in, you know, there's a long time till that happens, right? There's still you know, a long time till those things start to kick in. But yeah, so dare to be trivial is what Tony Michaels said. Yeah, and, and I just, uh, have, having talked with Ron Alexander, who's, who's working with the AFCO group, um, where the fertilizer industry obviously plays a major role in that group, uh, there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of cooperation in his perspective. As he's bringing organics and compost to that forum, uh, there's a lot of pushback from the fertilizer industry. So. Obviously, somehow the composting area has gotten enough under their skin that they're kind of holding back. I mean, it'd be great if, if they think of us as so small that they can let us do whatever we want and we can write the regulations to use compost and other recycled phosphorus products locally. That would be great if they could step aside and let that happen, but I don't see that. Huh. Yeah, it's an interesting perspective. You know, at, when you asked what what I didn't hear come up, and, and um, I'm new to the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance, so I don't know that it has a place here, but I certainly was am curious about those larger market forces, especially relative to phosphorus in the U.S. I remember a couple of years ago um, being at WEFTEC, the, the big industry, the, the big thing for the wastewater industry, the big conference every year for the wastewater industry, and having someone from Monsanto there refer to um, their mines, their phosphorus mines in, in Florida, that the quality was getting worse and worse. And so, you know, we saw the numbers early in the day about the, the number of years projected, which obviously there's huge variance around those projections. But I thought that was interesting when he said that the quality is getting worse. And what does that mean in terms of um, the price point where recovered phosphorus starts to look better? And so that's just one of those kind of things that, that I was curious. I don't know if anybody here can can reference it or, 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 or speak to it. But I was also wondering, you know, when you talk about scalability, I think of, um, like I saw someone here from Veolia. I don't know. Ah, all right. And so, you know, companies like Veolia are in a, a position to be able to take some technologies, even though the human, um, uh, you know, recovery from human sources is maybe a small piece of the pie. It's still important for lots of other reasons. And Veolia is the kind of company that could take that to scale. Um, uh, and I, and so I don't know if, if you have thoughts on that or others who are in a position to be able to take some of these technologies to scale might have something to say. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> Discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to your point, and that, that's really exactly why I'm here. Um, the challenge that we're facing, and, and, and everybody knows it, is, is just that. So we, we have to, there, there's, you know, the, the public, at least in the America, you know, is, is beginning to now be concerned about sustainability and, and, and those kinds of things. But at least Veolia, you know, and, and the market that we're focusing, which is the municipal wastewater market, the drivers aren't there. I mean, there, there are there are cities and towns now who are, are being, you know, circular economy and sustain, you know, focused on that. But those are the big, you know, that's the DC waters, the Denver metros, the, the big. They, they they form their own companies essentially, and are, and are able to do that. But if you look at the waste, the volume of wastewater treated in the U.S. in terms of total volume, they're a small part. Most of that wastewater is in plants that are five NGD and less. 
these types of towns just don't have the drivers in place to adopt those technologies because there's no payback. I can't convince a, a small town in the Midwest that they should adopt a Struvite recovery process if it doesn't, if there's no payback for them. It's, it's very different. So that's the challenge we're facing, I think. Not only me, but, but the same guys here from, from Astaire and some of the others are facing those kinds of challenges. And I, it's, so it's a difficult challenge. I don't know how to, I mean, I think we're going to have to have some some governmental funding or some of those things to push those toward, toward smaller plants. It's going to be a challenge to, to, to get to deploy those technologies. You know, and, and the companies like the old, you know, we have to do that and do that at a profit. We can't do it at a, at a loss, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we have to make money doing it. Anything else someone would like to give? Dave has a comment. Oh, sorry. I'm also in the wastewater industry. Uh, I'd like to add, we also have competing pressures. So for example, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed with the TMDL program, the limits on wastewater treatment plants for discharging are very, very low for phosphorus. And that causes them to use iron or aluminum to precipitate that phosphorus. And in doing so, it precludes them from using other technologies that would be phosphorus recovery systems. Uh, yep. And so it, it's a chicken and egg argument, I suppose, from their point of view, is what do you want to do? You can see some companies, I believe Berlin now in Germany, is doing whole phosphorus removal from a wastewater treatment plant, but even with extensive treatment, their target is, I believe, 50% removal from their whole waste stream, which, which is a problem, but uh, we're not there yet technology-wise. You know, there's a company in Missoula, a very small one called Clear As. They're operating small plants, and they do a algae treatment at the end that does very low, achieves very low phosphate release, and then the algae are available for re I'm recovery. I'm familiar with Clear As, and they're facing the same. They're facing the same they don't challenge. Have is the cost of their technology yeah. is phenomenally high. Yeah. Um, it's on the order of um, like I forget, like ten dollars a gallon or something to, to implement. Now it works very well. So they're facing the same challenges. They end up with a product that they're trying to market, and then and they're really trying to, you know, this algae product, which is great, but it's they're facing the challenge. Yeah, who's going to buy it? Who's going to buy it? Yeah, that's right. Right, Dave, you're going to solve it all. I do have a response for it. about the algae uh, uh, with regard to uh, using plants. I guess the algae are not actually plants, but. Uh, if you're like me, when you go to uh, Disney World in Florida, you go visit their wastewater treatment plant, <laughs> which very nicely is next to the topiary <laughs> garden, which is kind of cool. But uh, they have an interesting process, or, or had at least when I was there. Uh, they use floating uh, water hyacinth. So the, the, the uh, roots are hanging in the water, absorbs the uh, nutrients. Uh, absorbs the energy from the sun, then they mulch it up, they put it in the digester, and they make natural gas out of it, uh, make uh, methane out of it. Uh, but I wanted to res uh, also respond to the issue of the change in the grade of uh, phosphorus, uh, uh, phosphate ore. Uh, there is, s some have reported a slight downward trend in the grade. Uh, typically, to be economically usable, you need about 30 or 32 percent P205. Uh, and so there is a downward grade. That, that there are, when we say running low of phosphorus, they really mean running low of the economically available phosphorus. Uh, and actually in, in Florida, where most of the U.S. production is, uh, also not far from Disney World in Central Florida, uh, they tell, they've told me that they lose more phosphorus to land development up on the surface than to the consumption of mining, because when you develop the land, uh, you can know, you know, under the city of St. Augustine, there are a lot of phosphorus res res uh, resources. You're not going to uh, mine there. Uh, and there are, you know, there are a lot of phosphorus resources offshore North Carolina, for example. And we have not uh, uh, gotten to that. Uh, uh, we don't have the technology to make that economical at, at this point. All right, there's a lot of things. Anything else someone needs to say before we can relax and have a drink? No. Yeah, I mean, a quick, quick comment and kind of highlight a challenge we have. One, put things in perspective. Uh, we operate in Ireland and in the U.S. In, in North Carolina, 
we have a $2.50 per ton landfill surcharge. In Ireland, we have a 75 euro, which at today's exchange rate is about 98 or 99 dollars. Yeah, that'll do it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> change the, change the I think the other thing as a compost, one of the challenges we face is not so much the value for money proposition in absolute terms, but it's quantifying that because many green products or green options, you know, it's a long-term benefit. And that's, we struggle with that. And you know, we struggle with things like on a golf course, if a golf course fairway is nicer and greener, converting that, you know, is that more rounds played? You know, it's, it's, it's much easier in an agricultural setting where you say, well, you get an 8% increase in yield or something like that, or you can cut back your fertilizer. So a lot of those are strong water management and that where cities are spending literally billions of dollars in strong water management. And they're, most cities are very open to it. In some cases, they're brought in regulations on using green alternatives. But it's a very hard one to find. It's, it's a complex process to quantify those. Okay. Any other pressing items? Don't feel like you want to get on the plane and feel like there's something you wanted to say. Jerry's got something. Something you wanted to say and you don't want to get on the plane um, without Jerry having said Bindle it. Jerry with the dairy industry. Um, Steve Rowe spoke last year. Yep and then he was invited over to Europe. Um, I just wanted to tell you as a result of that, the um, technology catalog that we've built online with 200 and some technologies that uh, extract phosphorus from manure, nitrogen, or manage it will now include European technologies. And then the market trading that he talked about, Wisconsin, Vermont, California, in Pennsylvania are now having discussions about adopting some form of that and we're meeting with the EPA director uh, early in March to um, get their involvement in the market mechanism and Vermont is actually the governor's office is putting a bounty of sorts on phosphorus they import around 10,000 tons a year and there's a tariff on it so I just wanted to let you know you're having some impact here because there are going to be political solutions uh, to address this issue that will benefit everybody in this room. Okay. All right. Well, there's a lot to uh, think about um, from what we've heard today. A lot of themes came out of it that I've been thinking about. And certainly my thinking has changed a lot in the 10 or 11 years I've been working on this problem. Um, so just some practical matters before I give you my final thoughts for today. Uh, you'll get a survey afterwards, give, you, give us some feedback on the forum so we can make sure that it met your needs and that uh, you'll come back and we can make it better every year. Um, so keep an eye on that. Don't delete it, please. It'll only take a few minutes. Okay. Um, we'll try to recycle your badges. You can just leave them on that table on your way out. That'd be great. Um, we're going to go to Pastino's which is uh, over on the other side of campus in the direction of the hotel on College Ave. So um, please come for that and we can relax and, and you can really tell us what you think over a glass of wine <laughs> or something now that the video camera's turned off and the recording is over. Uh, share your th frank thoughts with us and we'll be glad to take them into consideration. Um, I do want to thank you all for coming, first of all. Um, and uh, thank you for your uh, participation today. So I think it was a really great day. Um, I do want to thank Matt Schultz very much for the arrangements he made in organizing all this. Um, he, he, yeah. So he, re he really makes me mad all the time because um, I'll send them an email, say do X, Y, or Z or whatever, something that's on my mind. He said, and inevitably he's already done it and a check your inbox or it's in the Dropbox or whatever. So it's really frustrating to work with him actually, <laughs> um, but uh, it's really quite amazing because he really does take care of things and you know, a great thinker about these issues as well as a, a, a really fantastic organizer of, 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 of the Alliance. And so we owe a lot to his uh, attention. Okay, so just a couple things. So I don't know, you feel like a wizard prophet today? I'm hoping everyone goes away thinking them, themselves, you know, is that, you know, we're not going to get anywhere, you know, with the green people throwing things at the blue people or the red people throwing at things at the blue people and back and forth, right? Um, 
I think in many ways that may have led us into some of the, you know, when Paul was reflecting about, you know, what mistakes we have made in the past or something. It may have been some of this kind of unproductive dialogue between different types of scientists, right, that led us into directions that weren't that fruitful, I think, and backed us into a, actually backed us into a corner behind a pile of manure, right? So now we've got to find our way out of this corner. So, um, so are you a wizard prophet or not? You know, that's the question of the day. Um, and so, yeah, so what about 2050, right? So here's the bus going to the, leaving the 20th century, going to 10 billion people. Um, here's the cliff, but there's someone, you know, so here it's in the front of the bus, there's these characters that blue and red on, right? So that's the side of transitioning to a new type of scientist, right, who works on these problems, new type of, of perspective on things, who doesn't imagine, right, that science and technology can solve every single problem, right? Or imagines that we can somehow protect the water by not growing any food. Right, well that's not a good solution either, right? So, so obviously, right, there has to be a harmony brought to these different perspectives and the past may have been fighting with, with each other. So, right, the kids down here, right? So there's this, I think, you know, the question we can ask is, does the future belong to the wizard prophets among us? Who is it that will bring the technological innovation as well as the systems level thinking about all the dimensions of complex problems that we can't really micro analyze anymore. We have to think bigger and more broadly about things as complex as the food water system that we are trying to sustain into the future. So again, our vision is uh, to create a food system with at least with respect to phosphorus that operates to produce abundant nutritious food that that's available for everyone who needs uh, to eat. But of course, we need healthy rivers, lakes, and oceans because those people will also need to drink. Um, and so we can't do one without the other. So there we are out on our little plank trying to get into the future uh, as, as, wizard, uh, as wizard prophets. So there's the top of the line. There. I was going to ask Allison from Farm to Market if she could leave her slide behind where she had all the logos on it that are members of Farm to Market because we could just use that slide next year because we'll have that many members, right? So, so our slide doesn't look like that right now, but it needs to look like that in a few years. So I want to just encourage you, right, to join us. We are, this stuff that we're working on, the endeavor we're, we're undertaking together exists because of people are interested in solving these problems and coming together around this issue. And uh, the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance will only exist as long as there are people who, and organizations willing to join and work together on this topic. So uh, we need you to join us. We need you to evangelize for us after this meeting. Go out and tell people about our existence. Um, we have a new marketing and communications person on the team who's also gonna help get the word out. But we need uh, help from our members, from our friends to uh, sell the alliance so that you know, we will continue to be able to advance the interests of those who are working in this sector uh, to uh, address this complex problem. So with that, I'm going to say I'm going to adjourn. Thank you all for coming. And we're going to be over at Postino's. And we have snacks available, but it's a cash bar, right? But I think you should buy Matt a drink. <laughs> OK, so thank you all. <laughs>